Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Each growing season, a gardener learns new things and has new questions. Today, we're going to answer some of those questions. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plots. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Joellen Diamond. Joellen's Director of Landscape at the University of Memphis. And Mr. D is with us today. How y'all doing? Hello. Good. Doing good. All right. So here's our Q&A segment. Y'all ready? Let's yes. All right. We have a lot of questions here. All right. Uh -huh. Here's our first viewer email. I have two weeping yopon holly foundation plants that are around 15 to 18 feet tall. I'm concerned about the roots. Both are within inches of the foundation. Should I be concerned about possible foundation and plumbing damage from these plants? The house is 24 years old. Thank mm -hmm. you for your opinion. This is Doug from Hernando, Mississippi. Yes. So, uh, Joanna, what do you think about those uh, foundation <laughs> plantings of those uh, yopon hollies? Yeah, the yopon hollies are basically trees. Okay. And yeah, so yeah. you're not supposed to plant a tree any closer than four feet from your foundation. And he's got it a little close. The fact that the tree has probably been there almost 24 years or at least 20 years out of that, um, it's time, most landscapes last 15 to 20 years. So since it's so close to the foundation, I would recommend him removing those mm -hmm. and starting over with something different there. Okay. And, and if it's gonna be a tree eventually, make sure it's at least planted four feet from the foundation. Right. So would you have to be concerned about the roots and the foundation? I mean, there's a lot of stories about that, myths about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you, you're just, that tree may not have roots that can do okay. that kind of damage to the tree because it's not a, an aggressive root growing okay. tree. You know, I don't see any surface roots growing around it, okay. but I would still not want something that close to my foundation. I would agree with that. All right. Mr. D, anything you want to add to that? Nope. Got right. it covered. Got it covered. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for the question. We appreciate that. Here's our next viewer email. I think Mr. D is going to like this one, Joel. Yeah. What can you suggest to remedy the intrusion of armadillos? <laughs> Please advise. Thank you. And this is Estelle from Southwest Mississippi, Mr. D. Southwest Mississippi. By far, the best option is a 12-year-old with a 20-grade <laughs> shotgun or a 22 rifle, I guess, in southwest Mississippi. Yeah. Uh, you know, I used to live down there pretty oh. close to Loosedale, so I, I know, well, that's on the other side of Mississippi. <laughs> but, uh, that's uh, uh, actually probably the best way to handle armadillos is with a trap. Yeah. And uh, armadillos aren't the smartest creatures in the world. Mm. Uh, and you probably don't just have one. Uh, uh, they they're all they're born as quadruples oh, wow. uh, okay. identical quadruple so there there there's four to a litter and it'll either be four little males or four little females and That's they'll become four big whatever and and uh, they they do a lot of damage but uh, a uh, a live trap mm -hmm. uh, you probably need to construct wings for that trap, uh, using one by sixes or even one by fours or two by fours, even would probably work to kind of guide them into the trap. Yeah. You know, put them on the edge of the trap and, and angle them out. And as they're feeding around, uh, they're looking for grub worms. That's mm -hmm. what their favorite diet is. And uh, uh, so as they're feeding, you can kind of direct them into the trap and then bait it with, you know, rotten fruit, fetid fruit or something yeah. that'll have larvae in it and, and things like that Goodness. you know even uh that'll probably be the best bet wow. and then uh when you catch them <laughs> yeah uh, let's go that's the million dollar question what do you do with them uh-oh uh do you have a neighbor you don't like <laughs> i guess uh, uh i can't uh, it's up to you to handle that situation yeah. once you catch them that may be where you want to bring the 12 year old in <laughs> yeah. Yeah. oh boy Oh my. But trapping is what you have to do. Trapping is the best way to get rid of them. I, I can't. <laughs> uh, you know, controlling grub worms, uh, yeah. uh, you know, might help uh, a little bit, but but uh, 
uh, they're still, you know, they're going to look for an area that hadn't been disturbed yeah. and, and yeah. you know, and, and uh, probably feed on an earthworm every once yeah. in a while too. And, and uh, uh, but uh, uh, trapping I, is, is the best method to get rid of them. All right, Mr. Still, trapping is the best method. And I remember before, Mr. D, you actually showed us how to do that. I did. Remember that? I did. I have actually constructed yeah. them, and uh, I have uh, personally, I've had better luck with a 20 gauge. Shotgun, <laughs> you know, personally. So. Personally, he says. All right. Yeah. So thank you for that question, Mr. Stell. Be careful, all right? Here's our next viewer email. I have several walnut and hickory trees in my yard. I have trouble telling the difference. Anyway. I noticed these weird spots on one tree's leaves. In the center of the spot, there is a hole through the leaf. Should I be concerned? If so, what is the problem and what should I do? Thank you, Mrs. Eric. So, Mr. D, we're going to come back to you. What do you think that is? It's a phylloxera. Yeah. It's an insect that uh, actually uh, it attacks the tree right as the leaves are coming out or at bud break. And, right. and they're, they're, uh, as the leaf grows, the the that uh, structure grows also. Uh, you know, you can spray with an insecticide at bud break if it's a problem, uh, uh, but it's not going to kill the tree. Uh, mm -hmm. The trees can tolerate that kind of damage. Yeah. Uh, a lot more common on on pecan trees right. than than uh, uh, the hickories. Not really a problem in commercial pecan orchards because they do spray, they have bud break sprays and they mm -hmm. take care of that. But in, in your landscape situation, if it's a small tree that you can spray, you know, you may want to spray that bud break with, uh, with uh, uh, one of the insecticides. But uh, uh, I, it's kind of unsightly. There's also a stem phylloxera mm. that uh, is probably a little more problematic than the leaf phylloxera. But, uh, that's what it is. Okay. Uh, uh, if it gets worse, I think some varieties are more susceptible or are more of a problem than others. But uh, if it's a problem, figure out a way to spray it at bud break. Okay. Spraying, you know, later in the year does absolutely no good at all. Wow. There's no good, you know. Uh, so it, bud break is the time to to okay. take care of the problem if you wow. go around. Maybe a hose. If it's trees large, a hose in sprayer or mm -hmm. you know. Not many homeowners have an air blast sprayer that can blow the, you know, all the way out through the top of the tree. But uh, yeah. So timing. 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 Anything you want to add to that, Joel? Yeah, well, if she wants to know which is which. You know, the walnut trees the, and the, and the uh, hickory trees both are compound leaves, and that's yeah. probably what where the confusion lies. But walnut trees tend to have each leaflet on that leaf about the same size, whereas hickory trees usually have a little bit larger leaflets towards the tip of the leaf. So she might look at that and see if she can tell the difference. Okay, that's good. All right, well, thank you for that question. Appreciate that. Timing is everything, all right? Here's our next viewer email. I've been fighting chamber bitter in my raised vegetable garden beds for three years to no avail. It spreads like wildfire and I can't pull it fast enough. My question is, can I kill chamber bitter in all the seeds by covering my raised bed with a tarp in the summer sun. This will let me start fresh next year. I know I will kill my soil doing that. This is why I haven't done it thus far. I don't want chemicals in it. Thanks in advance. And this is Create Again on YouTube. So, Jella, what do you think about that? So, wants to control chamber bitter in a raised bed with a tarp in the summer sun. Well, you can do that, but um, I would tend to, if you want to do solarization, which is which will help kill the weeds in the first what, inch or two of soil, you really need to use clear plastic so that it traps the hot air on top. Um, that's, what, that's how the solarization works. I have used uh, tarps and things like that, but the, you know, the sol it works, but the solarization yeah. with the clear plastic will work better. Right. Now, I don't know if it's been long enough. It's, it's, toward, it's, it's already August, September. You know, I, it's going to be, it, it might not be enough hot weather mm -hmm. for that to work this year. Right. So my suggestion is this. Why don't you tech, cut it in half and you, and do that to half of the garden next year. Use the other half and plant, but put mulch down. If you put enough mulch down, some of that uh, uh, bitter 
yeah, chamber, chamber bitter, bitter will not germinate because it's not going to have light to germinate. Right. So I would just put a lot of heavy mulching in. And, you know, I use hay for mulching mm -hmm. my okay. beds because I, I think it works better than straw. But I have used straw too. Okay. But yeah, put some in pine needles. I've even used pine needles in my bed for mulch. But I would put some type of, you know, mulch down around my plants and to help keep the weeds down, including the chamber bitter. Definitely do that because chamber bitter is tough, Mr. D. Yep, mm -hmm. it's hard to kill. Yeah. And he mentions that he's uh, afraid that he'll kill his soil. Yeah, so that's a good so, so, Solarization will not kill the soil, right. it'll only kill organisms in the soil, right. which hopefully kill the seeds and, and, the, and, the, and the bad bugs that you don't want down there. Right. Uh, but I wouldn't worry about killing my soil if I use solarization at all. Wouldn't worry about that. It just no. makes things better. Makes things better. Yeah, I wouldn't mm -hmm. worry about that, you know, as well. Yeah, but chamber bitter can be real tough. It's called a little mimosa. You know, it looks like a little mimosa tree. Um, so if you're going to pull it up, you definitely got to get all the root system. Yeah. Uh, because if not, it'll come back with a vengeance. Come right back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is pretty tough. So thank you for that question. All right, here's our next viewer email. In early August, I cut 15 bad words off my Japanese maple. Two days later, there were that many more. Will bad worms kill my Japanese maple? I am treating with seven. This is Margaret in Memphis, Tennessee. So Mr. D, so bag worms, right? Japanese maple, treating with seven. What okay. do you think? Uh, first off, if you pull 15 <laughs> off in August, and then more appeared, they were already there. You just didn't see them <laughs> yeah, because see them. Right. the bagworm, uh, they're, they're, they're starting of early May and, and there's one generation per year. And, and uh, that's when they're small. That's when you can kill them with insecticides. Or uh, BT, yeah. Bacillus thuringiensis, they're very susceptible to that. And that's what I would recommend that you use in May. Wouldn't use seven. Uh, malathion, if you want to go with an insecticide, actually works better than seven. But BT will do the trick for you and it won't harm any of your beneficial insects. Now, if you wait until August, nothing will kill them. Even, <laughs> even two bricks won't kill them. All they'll do yeah. is hurt your fingers when you slam the bricks together. Right. But uh, I, I mean, you can pick them off. You do, if you have them on the tree in August, they're not going to kill a tree. No, they're not going to kill the red maple tree. But if you have them on the tree in August, pick off all of them that you can and put them in a Walmart bag and double time and put them in the garbage or burn them. Don't just throw them in your compost pile or right. something like that because in August, those bags are, many of them are just full of eggs mm -hmm. and they're waiting to overwinter. Uh, or they're going, they're in the pupil stage or, you know, they're, 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 at a stage in their life cycle in August where they're probably not doing any more feeding right. at that point. Right. Right. Uh, point. Yeah. They are pretty much, you know, they're in that cocoon. And that, if you've ever tried to tear one of those cocoons apart, they are you've tried that for all, us. almost yeah, indestructible. Tough. It's yes. just almost right. indestructible. You can't it's do it with amazing. your fingers. You've got to have knives and scissors and amazing. equipment and stuff like that. Yep. But uh, just uh, if it's a problem for you, uh, early May, Go out there with BT and spray, and they'll take care of your problem. All right. Joy, yeah. anything you like to add? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, definitely. Get if you see any more on there, take them off now because that the seeds, the I mean, the eggs overwintering, they're not good. So you don't want to continue the problem. Right. But yeah, and then scout in the May and right. put the Early. BT on, and you might want to apply it again every two to three weeks. Yeah, read the label. If you don't on see, that, sure. you know. Um, the, the bagworms. A lot of times, if you notice them, they'll start wiggling, and and you go, what is? And then so you put the BT out, and BT works wonderfully. Yep. It does a great job, and it doesn't hurt anything. Good for the beneficials. Mm -hmm. This is true. All right, Miss Margaret. So timing is everything, and knowing what to use is most important. Yes. All right, that's for sure. So here's our next viewer email. Hi, I have a contender peach tree and the leaves have red dots all over them and they are falling off the tree. Any idea what is causing this and any solutions that would help? Thank you. This is Greg from Central New York. So there you go, Mr. D, a peach tree growing in Central New York. How about that? How about that? Yeah. <laughs> How about that? Uh, and that is bacterial leaf uh -huh. spot and uh, some varieties of peaches are more susceptible to bacterial leaf spot than others, and obviously the contender 
just susceptible. Uh, it's not a fungal disease, it's a bacterial disease. So there are, are there are some things that you can do uh, early to, to help prevent that from being a problem. Uh, copper containing products, Coside is uh, one of the trade names that come to mind. Um, uh, but it's not gonna kill the plant. It's, it's unsightly and it, uh, it's not gonna help it at all. It's gonna interfere with photosynthesis, but uh, uh, that's what it is, bacterial leaf spot. Bacterial leaf spot, yeah. yeah. Practice good sanitation. Pick up right. those uh, diseased leaves. Right. And as you say, throw them in the trash. Right. right. Don't compost them. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And resistant varieties. Mm. Yep. All right, great. We appreciate that question. Here's our next viewer email. A large tree I have had in my backyard for decades is suddenly dying. The leaves are turning brown and curling, and it is summer. What kind of tree is this, and what can I do to save it? And this is... Gisa from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Joellen, so how about that one? Yeah, she's got a, yeah. I think it's Norway maple, but it definitely okay. is a maple. But I oh, believe it's, it's a Norway maple. Um, and, you know, Norway maples are actually invasive, so uh. it doesn't hurt my feelings too much if it's <laughs> not quite living, but I know she's been used to the shade and, and you know, all the benefits she's had from, the, from a tree that everybody right. has. Uh, the problem is, you know, it's a maple. That's the worst problem. There's a list this long of diseases and insects that attack maples. So it could be a number of those things that are going on because it is an older tree. And suddenly dying, you know, um, you would, the best thing I can think of is if you really want to know what it is and trying to save it, I would get a certified arborist out there and have them look at the tree and see if they see any holes from bores in there, um, if they can determine if there's any kind of uh, damage to the tree, like that could cause part of it to die. Mm -hmm. it, it, yeah. All sorts of things, you know, weed eater damage, tree, you know, somebody's hit part of the bark at the base of one section. There's all sorts of things that can yeah. go wrong with the tree, but without being there and seeing that, you know, it's hard to tell. So I would get you know, a certified arborist out there because it is a big tree and it is next to her house. So. Right. Yeah, so you don't want it to be a hazard. Mm -mm, no. Okay. All right, Gisa, thank you for that question. Mr. D, anything you'd like to add to that? I just, and we had maple trees in my yard when I was growing up uh, on the family farm and uh, we had probably half a dozen and three of them were big when I was a little boy. Mm -hmm. And they're still there, but the center of the tree is dying out. They're losing limbs. Uh, some of the little bitty maple trees that are now big maple trees, and you know they just don't last forever. And uh, uh, like you said, there are a lot of problems that you know maple borer, and you know there there there's just a lot of problems that can affect maple trees. And so that's probably you know it just yeah. maybe time to you know. They really make good duck call, pretty duck calls out of the <laughs> trunks of maple trees, you know, curly maple and things yeah. like that. You may want to turn that tree into, take it to the woodworking shop, maybe. Maybe time. Maybe time. All right. well, we appreciate that question. Here's our next viewer email. This one is interesting. We are trying to grow passion fruit. We have one purple vine and one yellow banana passion fruit vine. Both have had three green passion fruit for about three months, but they aren't ripening. Both grow in full sun and in soil raised up to about 30 centimeters because the natural ground is very bad gray clay. How about mm -hmm. that? What can we do to get our passion fruit to ripen? They were planted in September of 2021 in the spring. And this is Deborah from Birth, Western Australia. Yes. How about that? That's great. Huh. So you think we can help her out? Well, I would I hope so. And They're I, not I, ripening. So. I, have, I have a few more questions, okay. though. You know, um, how often does she water it? What has the weather been like? Has it been consistent rain? Because I'm wondering if nutrients and watering are part of the reason why it's not, you know, ripening. But it takes a long time to ripen these fruits anyway. So, but if they're just stunted and not doing any more, I'm wondering what the watering and nutrient regime she has right. going on. I wonder the same thing, because again, you have three green passion fruit, not been ripening for three months. Yeah, that's right. 
That's so a much little a D, long. That's why, yeah. That's a little long. Of course, some of the varieties take three months, ah, okay. and some take longer. And yeah, some, some take longer. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know whether. But still, I'd like to know what her, you yeah, know, I watering and what yeah. the fertilizing she has done, yeah. and what the weather's been like. Right. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Different seasons for us. Yeah. yeah September twenty twenty one. You know. Was spring for her. Yeah, spring. Yeah. So. Right. <laughs> okay. Interesting. But yeah, very bad gray clay. <laughs> So well, they're raised. It's, yeah, so they're I mean, raised. that's a great idea. Yeah, and obviously nice. the vines are doing well. And she's yeah. gotten fruit on both of them, yeah. which is fantastic. Yeah. But they're just not ripening. Right. And hopefully, you know, she's been watering them during droughts. And they're keeping them moist. Um, but I think, you know, just don't overwater them. Because I know that can be a problem yeah, sure can. with passion fruit. Too much too. water or too little water. Can yes. Yep. Prevent them from ripening. Right. Sure can. All right. That in nutrients, that's for sure. All right, Ms. Deborah, we appreciate that question. Hope Thank that you helps. Much. Yeah, hope that helps you out there. All right, here's our next viewer email. What has happened to my two-year-old rosemary? As you can see, I cut away a brown section, but have more brown spots on the plant. Is it because the dog waters that plant every day? This is Lisa in Murfreesboro, Tennessee on Facebook. So, yeah, the dog waters it. Every day, a lot of brown sections. Uh, what comes to mind, Joella? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that can be attributing because yeah. think of it, you know, the salt in that, and as hot as it's been this summer, mm -hmm. would make me think that it's too high a salt content for the tree to be able to, I mean, the rosemary to, to keep staying green because it's just too salty. Um, but, uh, yeah, and then are you watering it enough yeah. or washing it enough? I would not want the dog watering my rosemary, especially <laughs> if I'm, I'm going to eat some of yeah. it. But, you know. Um, okay, let me get this started. All right, okay. Here we go. All right. Rosemary is an herb, right? Her rosemary is an, is an herb. Here we go. And we put herbs in the food that we eat. Yes. <laughs> okay. We see where this is going. Yeah, I'm just wondering yeah. if the rosemary tastes different or, or uh, if the flavor is affected. I'd be more worried about that than uh, I wouldn't put the leaves with it. the brown spots on it. I wouldn't put that in my food. I don't think. <laughs> no, I don't yeah, I mean, I mean, either either move the plants, you know, so that it's not a favorite place for the dog, or you know, um, fashion a yeah, fence or something put it around in the pot, it. Put it. High enough, the dog can't, can't reach, reach it. it. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah, that's a better suggestion. That's a, that's a, that's yeah. a good suggestion. Electric fence, maybe? <laughs> no, I don't think you need to go that much trouble. <laughs> Electricity, good thing. <laughs> uh -oh. But, yeah, I mean, I, all that could be contributing to. Yeah. I mean, it's just a, a, a bunch of things. And if she's continually wa r rinsing it off and watering it, it could be a little bit of rock going on, too, it because it's too wet. Rocks. So... Moving it to a, a, a potted plant somewhere with a, with, might fix a lot of these different problems. All right. Get it away from the dog. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there you have it, Miss Lisa. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Here's our next viewer email. What are these white specks on my crepe myrtles leaves? And this is Lou. So, Joan, what do you think that is? Um, well, you know, it, it looks like it could be aphids because aphids are notorious for being yeah. on crepe myrtles yeah. um, and causing it to be, the leaves to be sticky because mm -hmm. they're kind of shiny. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be a little bit of a scale too, but most likely aphids. What I'm wondering is why aphids are on it to begin with. And I'm thinking air circulation, maybe, lack of air circulation. And I want to know if the crepe myrtle it blooms where it's located. I'd like to see, you know, the, the crepe myrtle either thinned mm -hmm. or or something. It's, does the crepe myrtle bloom? And, but it looks, aphids are a sign of stress. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to think, crepe myrtle's like full sun. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, and good airflow, and I'm wondering if there's that's lacking in some of the area. Now you can treat it. Mm -hmm. Aphids are easy to treat. What? Yeah. Insecticidal soaps yeah. or neem oil or sometimes just washing them off. Um, yeah, but e easy. But I think there's a different problem that's causing the aphids and that's what I was I think he needs to, to look at okay. and address. I go along with that. Sometimes uh, aphid numbers can build up to a certain point 
where uh, a natural disease will come in and take them out too. So uh, I don't know whether you've reached your, uh, what's well, not your economic threshold, it's just your aesthetic threshold. Uh, okay. When you reach your aesthetic threshold, you know, give, give, give it enough time to allow beneficials to come in and maybe mm -hmm. take them out or, uh, you know, a, a, a natural disease to come in and take them out. But, you know, then once you reach the point where you can't stand it anymore because it looks bad and you're getting a lot of sooty mold on, mm -hmm. on the honeydew that they're secreting, then, then you want, need to do something then. You to do something. And you right. may never reach that point. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. True. But you're right. It's got to be stress. It's it's stress of some kind. Yeah. Some type of stress, yeah, because there seems to be a, an aphid species for every plant species oh. <laughs> these days. Yes, in all right. different colors. Yes, that's for sure. So, But those little white structures yes. we need to mention, those are the right. exoskeletons. The, exoskeletons. Uh, the aphids right. are molting and they're going through different life, life stages and that's why you see so many of the little bitty funny looking white mm -hmm. structures on the mm -hmm. leaf. And, mm -hmm. Pretty uh, neat. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can see that. Yeah. It's a good picture. <clears throat> yeah, it is a good picture. Thank you for that, Lou. We appreciate that. All right, Joel and Mr. D, that was fun. Yep, yes, it was. a lot of questions. It was yep. fun. <laughs> Thank you much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplots 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. That was a lot of questions. We answered a lot more while we were taping this show. If you want to see those questions and answers, go to familyplotgarden.com. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.